Hello out there in commentary land. This is Victor Salva, writer-director of Jeepers Creepers, and uh, happy to take you on the adventure of making this movie, and it certainly was an adventure. It is probably the most trouble and the most fun I've ever had making a movie. Uh, the music you're hearing right now is a cue that I actually created on my Macintosh as part of a temp score that I um, created for the film. And uh, it was such a weird sound that uh, kind of expressed the doom and gloom to come in a very weird and unique way that we decided to actually use it in the finished film. Jeepers Creepers was a song written in 1938 for another film, which name escapes me. It was written by the famous Harry Warren and Johnny Mercer, and has been recorded over 250 times since then by various artists. You're looking at Central Florida, and the heat coming off the road there is no special effect. We had average temperatures of 90 to 110 degrees each day. That was one of the things that made Jeepers probably one of the most grueling and physically taxing shoots that I've ever been a part of. We chose Florida because it looked so much like sort of rural heartland that the script called for. I originally thought that they were crazy when they said we could find this in Florida. When I think of Florida, I think of palm trees and beaches. But this is central Florida and the heart of horse land, horse country, and they have these wonderful wide open spaces, beautiful old trees with hanging moss, perfect for the ambience of our film. There's Gina, and the sweat on the lovely Miss Gina is absolutely real. These kids really sweated away on this insert car, believe me, day after day. I was really lucky to end up with Gina and Justin. I don't want to gush, but when a director finds two kids that perfect for what he wrote, it's a dream come true, and these guys were really troopers. It's kind of a funny story about this dairy misreading the license plate on the um, Winnebago here. The script said that he actually thought it said 6A forever, but my assistant on the film, Brian Hirschberger, when he first saw that license plate, he thought it said gay forever. Then he thought it said gay fever both which were funnier than what was in the script, so we just threw them in and ran with it. The couple riding this Winnebago was supposed to be much more elderly. I wanted the gentleman to be bald-headed, but since he had to be a stuntman to drive this Winnebago in the film, we had to settle for something a little, a little less to the point of the script. You know that is you in 40 years. This is the only time in the film when we're really allowed to build Trish and Derry's character. Gee, like, maybe I like the country? And it's funny because at preview screenings, we were pressured over and over again to cut this stuff shorter and shorter and get to the truck, get to the truck. But what people don't realize is that if you don't invest a few fleeting moments in the characters for a film, no matter what happens after that, it's going to be less significant. The first truck attack comes within five minutes of the film. But for some people... I'm assuming those with shorter attention spans, that was still too long. I don't, I don't care. I'm just saying, if you broke it off with them, you should at least figure out what you can get to The Loop Group did some great evangelists here that she's tuning through. Really fantastic. A Loop Group called L.A. Mad Dogs, who I did powder with. I wanted something really funny and kind of endearing for Derry to do before the onslaught of this horrible truck, so... I wrote this country western song, music and lyrics, that he could kind of sing mocking what she had just heard on the radio. Back in the distance, we're doing what I call my Hitchcock reveal of the truck. It starts off as a tiny speck growing and growing and growing with the kids unaware. I didn't know you were evil or that you would hurt me. Mr. Polly, This might be a good time to point out that, yes, I am a huge fan of Duel. I saw it as a young boy in 1972 when it was a movie of the week. It remains one of my favorite films of all time, and while I don't think I was consciously doing an homage to Duel, 
I certainly think that uh, the truck sequences here are sort of a loving remembrance of a time when I was very young and I first got really excited about filmmaking. Get off the, road and let him pass you. the old truck that we're using here is a late 40s model Rio. It was actually a flatbed truck and had to have the entire back built onto it by our wonderful production designer, Stephen Legler. I chose Stephen Legler as my production designer on this film for a number of reasons. Not just his uh, incredible qualifications, but the fact that he had first worked in Florida in 1993 as Joe Dante's production designer for Matinee, and also that he had designed the majority of Alan Rudolph's films and was visual effects art director for the big screen version of Godzilla and had also worked with Roland Emmerich on Independence Day meant that he had an extensive effects background. And one thing that you really need in a film like this is for the art department and all the different effects teams to be working together on the same vision. And uh, Stephen was eminently qualified. And he did a fantastic job, not just in making the film look terrific, but in making sure that all departments were on the same page. No, 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 they never found her head. They found the car. Here's the kids are talking about the urban legend of Kenny and Darla. Still shaking. I don't think every generation has their cautionary tale of drinking and driving on prom night. I don't know. I always heard it was true. Wheaton Valley High, class of 78. When Trish first heard that story, she says, she thought this was the road she would die on. That's kind of our first red herring. Most horror films are so predicated on girls or women dying that we drop that on purpose to sort of begin to mislead the audience into thinking that it's Trish actually who is in danger and not her brother. It's poly sci guy been doing to you anyway? Beating you? That was the license plate on the van we just saw. B-E-A-T-N-G-U. Beating you is the first sort of dark indication that the creeper has a sense of humor. And when I was originally writing the script, I wasn't sure exactly how much of a sense of humor the creeper should have. What, is this a brand new rule, huh? It's not a new rule. It's always been this way. Since when? Since always. Since just now, maybe. Memories for shit. No, it's not. Uh-huh. 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 This scene is incredible for only one reason, and that is that this is Justin Long actually urinating. He wasn't supposed to. We weren't supposed to see anything. But on the last two takes, just as the magic hour hit and the golden light came up, the golden shower came out. I've heard of actors with incredible control, but none like Justin because he peed for the first take and stopped, and then the next take he peed again. He still won't tell me how he did it, but uh, that's what I call a disciplined actor. This is kind of the last breath in the film we have of the kids just being kids before everything changes for them. This might be my favorite Trish and Derry moment in the film. I just really like the kids. I love the light, which was very beautiful there at the end of the day. And it's the last calm before the storm. You don't. Hi, Mom. Haven't seen you in forever. Here's my dirty I like the simplicity of this story. I like how quietly it starts out, how simply it starts out, and how it just escalates from there, layer by layer by layer, darker and darker and darker, and the stakes keep getting higher and higher and higher. Mama's boy. Daddy's whore. Dick liquor. We rehearsed a lot, or as much as possible. I think we had about a week. But a week's rehearsal is kind of a misnomer. We did some improvs. We went through every scene in the script. But I think total rehearsal time couldn't have been more than a day or two. There's usually so many other things to do at that point in the schedule that the director is torn by every department as shooting nears and doesn't always get to spend a lot of time with the actors. We're coming up on the first scene with the church. This church was originally known as the St. James, an African-American church with conflicting and mysterious tales about murder and tragedy that resulted in its falling into disrepair. It's beating you. This is an actual antique church and one of the reasons why we chose Central Florida for our location. What's he doing? 
I think we need to be very careful about how characters are revealed in films, and this is the Creepers reveal. We did at least seven takes driving by just bodies going in the tube and him not noticing, and there just was some element missing. But boy, when we had him stop and turn and watch, it was so powerful. That was the first time I think we all really got excited about what the movie could be when we saw that in dailies. Wrapped in a sheet. Wrapped and roped in a sheet. Wrapped and roped in a sheet with red stains on it. Just get us out of here. Right. Grab my cell phone. Where? It's in the gym bag. If you watch closely here, you're going to see a fence in the background of this shot. Way in the back with a little truck. That's George Steinbrenner's fence for his horse ranch, which ran adjacent to the church and which we continually were trying to crop out of the picture. God damn it, what did I say? My car! I should have taken my car! He's coming up right on our ass. I really like Bennett's score here. Bennett Salve and I, this is our third film and our first opportunity to paint with a huge orchestral brush. And he took this chase and all these angles and just played the daylights out of them. And I did my best in the mix to keep the music up and the sound effects down. Because sadly what happens in most films, especially action films or action sequences, is the music gets buried and the sound effects take over. But music is so much more evocative than, you know, we've heard a car screech and we've heard a, an engine rev a million times. This is original music written shot to shot to enhance the excitement of the scene. So I play the music up and the effects down and I really love what Bennett did for this chase scene. As fierce as this old truck looks, the main problem that we had with it was that it kept dying. Uh, it had a very old engine in it. The Chevy had a very old engine in it. And uh, there are a lot of funny outtakes, even of the chase here, with both of them just kind of puttering to a stop instead of doing anything terribly exciting. Here comes Gloria and Shane, our animal wranglers, with these boxes of homing pigeons. And they lie down in the grass and they release the pigeons out of these boxes on my cue. And the pigeons fly into the air and since they're homing pigeons, they fly home. Miles and miles away, but they fly home. Justin is tying the hood with one of his pink jockey shorts that he talked about from uh, dorm life in college. I like threading through the whole story, things that were talked about earlier. Sounds in fact, right. at the diner, he'll hold up another pair of them, and what? you'll see that those are dyed pink as well. I know a little. car makes a strange noise. You just get a new tape, Dara, you told me. I told you. I learned it from you. This is the moment when... Uh, we really need the kids to go back to the church. And the most criticism that I've taken on this film is about this scene, because I think everyone in their heart of hearts doesn't think they would ever go back, even if they thought someone might be hurt or needing help. So as a writer, I wanted to find a really authentic and effective way of letting these kids go back to the church without the audience saying, oh, come on, this would never happen. They would never do this. And the only way I could was by asking myself, what question could they ask me that would get me to go back? And, you know, it was, what if it was you back there? Empathy suddenly ruling out all logic and self-preservation. Because this is why girls are smarter, okay? This is also a great scene for Gina and Justin. They handle it so well. And once again, we were shooting it at the end of the day in Magic Hour, and it is also one of the most beautiful parts of the film. Strangely enough, I had to ask Don Fauntleroy, my DP, to take some of the color out of these scenes because they were so beautiful that they kind of went against the grain of the idea of the movie. There were um, shots of the creeper van, for instance, driving at uh, dusk 
rimlet by gold light that we just had to take the color out of because it shouldn't look beautiful. There should be a muted, strange kind of eerie feeling about everything. I'm not getting out of this car. You don't have to. I'm not. This DVD transfer is a little more lush color-wise. For instance, the purple sky there isn't really purple in the actual release prints of the film. And the scene that we're looking at right now with going back to the church is another scene where we really had to pull the colors kind of down so that it wouldn't seem too bright and cheery. We had to create this driveway to the old church as well as ask the farmers who own the surrounding fields to please let their fields grow wild. So by the time we got to this location, it looked very overgrown and unattended. This move was really a very happy accident as we were rehearsing a more standard crane up to look down at the car. As we were taking the crane back down, we saw it climb down the steeple and it became a, a super move that we said, okay, let's just put that in the movie. Crows are an incredibly complicated element to add to movies, as I guess any birds might be, but since these are my first, I found out a lot of things. Number one, crows are trainer-specific, which means that they only respond to the one person who trained them. They also are incredibly smart birds. If they fly away, they don't come back. Even when they fly, they're flying on wires, which are later digitally removed. Another interesting note about these birds is that it is illegal to keep or train black crows in the USA. So the crows used in jeepers are actually African pie crows with their white breasts dyed black. It's also against the law in the state of Florida to film crows or blackbirds even in their natural habitat. The pipe the kids are approaching right now, uh, there's actually three lengths of pipe. This is a six-foot length, which is laying in a shallow hole here at the church. Oh, my God. Oh. Once we go inside the pipe and look back out, we're actually on a sound stage where we have a length of, I think, 20 or 30 feet. And behind them, another tribute to Don Fauntleroy, who is an incredible DP. That's a big white backdrop that's backlit with leaves hanging in front of it. There's nothing real about that sky or that background. And every time I see these shots cut together with the exterior of the church, I'm always amazed. Hey! Anybody down there? When I first wrote this scene, I really enjoyed the delicious possibilities of this long, kind of weird oh! pipe and the scare value that I could get out of it, since it's really a tunnel into some subterranean world that, as of yet, we don't see. There's someone down there. I just heard him. Hello! You're hearing things, Derry. Derry, don't even think about it! This is the only self-referential line in the film. Okay, you know the part in scary movies where somebody does something really stupid and everybody hates them for it? This is it. And I only use it because I wanted the audience to understand that my kids, my Trish and Derry, have seen all the Scream and Freddy movies. They do live in the horror universe. They just don't for a moment think they could be a part of it. The feet? Once again, this is wonderful cutting back and forth between location and soundstage, which is a very good time to mention my editor, Ed Marks. This is our second picture together, and the second of what I hope is many more. Ed really lets me find my movie. We come back with all these bits and pieces, and he lets me put them together, put sound and music to them to kind of create what I'm looking for, which I'm not always sure what that is until it all comes together. I just saw it again. Okay, something is definitely moving now. I had no idea how big a jump these rats would get in a crowded theater, but at the first preview screening, when everyone, 500 people, leapt out of their seats at the same time, I was thrilled, as you might guess. 
This is Justin actually sliding across the room on his feet and hitting a wall, not a floor. But the angle masks that he is actually sliding across and not falling down. That was a, a trick that I learned from watching the original Omen when Lee Remick falls off a balcony and turns and falls onto a wooden floor. Here now we have what I think is the most perilous situation in the film. Derry trapped down in this really strange and dark world that we know nothing about and his sister above, only able to really call down to him and nothing more. My producer, Barry Opper, suggested that as Derry slides down the pipe, he loses a shoe. And he suggested it for what I think is one of the most wonderful reasons you could suggest it. Later in the sequence here, I have Justin stopping to tie his shoe, which seemed like a very conspicuous thing to do considering all his surroundings and circumstances. Barry thought that if his shoe fell off and he just had time to pull it on and he was walking around, then he tripped over the lace, it would make perfect sense for him to stop and tie his shoe. And then I could do my reveal of my bodies, which I do when Justin's tying his shoe, and it became something terrific. Thank you. We read many young men in Central Florida for the role of the dying boy. But due to budgetary constrictions and some confusion, we didn't know if he was going to be allowed to speak or not. Someone who speaks in a film is six to seven hundred dollars a day, and someone who doesn't could be as cheap as sixty to seventy dollars a day. So when the boys came in to read, we told them that they had to communicate everything without a sound. Chris Shepardson did that so perfectly that by the time it came to actually shoot the scene, we really wanted him to make a sound. We really wanted him to at least whisper something. We found our body. You what? We found our body. Ah! Jesus! Ah! Our dying boy, Chris Shepardson, sort of claws at his sheet. He's about to reveal this incredible incision that the creeper has left him with. One of the ideas that doesn't completely translate to the film is that the creeper takes certain parts from certain people and then sews them back up and sews them together as part of his artwork. And uh, we didn't have time to do enough detail on the bodies that are in the Cavern of the Dead to show that most of them had incisions. The dying boy here is kind of the last bastion of this idea. In the script, the boy tries to explain that something took my, took my, that's all, really the only words he can get out. So uh, when Chris is whispering in Derry's ear, he's really trying to say, took my, but it sounds more like just hi, like that's all he could get out was hi. I really love the way Justin plays fear. He jumps in with both feet. I think the thing I was most impressed with at Justin's audition is that he wasn't one of hundreds of guys that came in and played it cool. They couldn't go to that scared place. Justin was so naked and raw with his fear that I thought it was about time that we showed a film where when a guy sees something traumatic, it really takes an emotional toll on him. And one of the things I'm most proud of about Jeepers Creepers is that... There's a lot of thought and a lot of emotional weight to what's going on. Even though it's my monster movie, I think it has a lot of emotional truth in it, and I think that's what makes it stronger and even scarier on many levels. What are you looking at? Get out to the road and find somebody who can help. Well, how are you going to get out of there? This is, this is, this is some, some, some kind of basement, right, for the church? 
Gina, like Justin, came in and gave just an incredible audition. She also has, inherent in her own personality, a very ballsy, take control, don't give me any shit that was absolutely perfect for Trish. One of the things that I love about Trish's character, and this is my first female lead that I've ever written, I'm glad that she's so strong, so uh, caring at the same time. Uh, by the end of the picture, she is really pleading for her brother's life in a very operatic way that I think is terrific for a movie like this. The House of Pain set was the biggest set constructed for the film. It was the biggest set ever constructed for a film that I've made. This is my fifth feature film. Um, for me, this is the darkest and richest and most deliciously scary part of the movie. Not just because this set is so fantastic, but Bennett's score also, I think, reaches a dark pinnacle here that is the stuff that horror movies that I love are made of. This is the section of the film where the most powerful and darkest reveals are made, I think, as this world kind of opens up to Derry. There's a wonderful likeness of the creature carved into the wood of this table that is actually a self-portrait the creature has done of himself. with his face open and his wings open, which is a complete foreshadowing of the creature we'll see at the end of the picture. Also present are all the spools of thread and things that he uses to sew his bodies together and create his art. A great reason to stop, tie the shoe, and do this kind of cool reveal of the bodies on the wall that his flashlight, which is now tucked under his arm, is lighting. Kind of lets us see them before he does, which I think creates its own kind of tension in a, in a scene like this. There are always financial limitations on every film and in every budget. In this case, the art department suffered very dramatically. It was constantly having money taken out of its budget and the bodies on the wall became a real concern. This entire cave is supposed to be covered with bodies that are all sewn together like this sort of quilt. And we ended up being able to afford very few bodies. In fact, in this shot, which is really the signature shot of this scene, I can only thank Steven Legler for arranging what I'm sure is every body we had into this frame to suggest that the bodies just go on and on and on. A little known fact about Jeepers Creepers is that a week before we were going to shoot, I had to find a way to save an incredible amount of money. And uh, I removed 20 pages from the finale of my screenplay and knocked a week off the shooting schedule from 40 to 35 days. And I was really afraid that perhaps I had hurt the structure of my story. But Francis assured me that uh, by downscaling the finale, to something that had to be much more intimate and personal that it would ultimately be stronger and I have to agree with him. I have a cameo here which I do in every film. This is my most strange. If you watch the body on the wall here in front of Justin you'll see there's my head there on that body. I have several cameos in this film and I'll point all of them out as we go. I do a few because you never know which ones are going to get cut out. This is Derry discovering that the tale of Kenny and Darla is a real one, that this prom couple is not only dead and sewn together and 
Not only are they uh, Wheaton Valley High, as Trish mentioned in the car earlier, but uh, that Darla did indeed lose her head. In fact, here it is sewed back on. This is um, every horror filmmaker's dream to set something up like this, where you give the audience information that the subject doesn't have. In this case, this truck slowly sneaking up on Trish. Her looking everywhere but where she should. We purposely had Gina look and stare and look and stare because we knew the longer she waited, the more crazy it would make people. Again, Bennett jumps in with a very snappy and scary kind of frenetic score. The actual Chevy Impala that she's driving had to have phony gear shifts put on the floor because uh, the stick shift on this particular model was on the steering wheel. That is the an actual front of one of the creeper trucks with just a um, flatbed and hay on the back to look like a completely different truck, like a farmer's truck. Justin wanted this moment to be so authentic when he came up from the horrors below. <laughs> It took him quite a bit of concentration and time to kind of sink into this place that we see in his eyes here. I realized that I had selected two actors who are going to really elevate this material by taking it to another level. Justin's dark mood here, where he seems almost comatose with trauma, I thought was just uh, a terrific indication that not only had I made the right choice in casting, but that while we make Jeepers Creepers, we should think of it uh, not just as a horror film, but truly a kind of dark work of art, as Francis had always sort of envisioned it would be. Now we have to stop. You hear me? Terry. This is one of the first scenes between brother and sister that was really cut down to what we see here. Just like this. This is also the introduction of Bennett's brother and sister theme, which is a very lonely and forlorn piece. Just it back on kind of winds its way through the movie and ends up in uh, the extremely operatic finale. One of the great and fun things to know about Central Florida, at least for me, was that Jeepers Creepers shot just about a half hour away from a natural spring where the original Creature from the Black Lagoon shot their underwater scenes. Creature from the Black Lagoon is still my personal favorite movie monster. Here we are at Opper's Diner, which was just a cement block before Stephen Legler and Kevin Eglin came in and put gasoline pumps and signs and basically turned this empty cement block into this old greasy spoon diner. This is one of those scenes where we really tried to take the color out because here's the creeper van driving at magic hour, beautifully backlit, and I was afraid that it would be too pretty rather than um, thinking that the juxtaposing of something beautiful uh, with something sinister was going to work. I was afraid that it was just, just too distracting to see all that beautiful light around the creeper truck. Excuse me. Shooting inside the diner was uh, a challenge because, once again, uh, this is our last daytime scene, and any time we shot during the day, we were shooting in at least 90 to 100 degree weather. 
something that uh, me being a California boy was, uh, I don't think I was prepared for it, uh, not to mention the 90% humidity, which means that you basically walk around like a tea bag all day. Just, just go tell them what you saw so that we can get out of here, okay? Come on, bro. This is a terrific moment here between brother and sister. Um, this scene goes on much longer. In fact, Gina has kind of a little backstory about the two of them that we very sadly had to cut for time. Gina performed it so well, and Justin, who is a great listener, and, you know, great acting is great listening, they both played off each other so well that we just really ached to take that out. But the diner sequence as a whole felt like it was too long a stop-off, and we did some very serious trimming. Patrick Cherry here is Binky, a character that we'll see a little bit later, and the introduction of Giselle as a voice on the telephone, played by the wonderful Patricia Belcher. You and your brother. M me and my brother. You and Derry, I saw you at This phone conversation was completely rewritten due to some story structure problems that we had. In other words, when we were actually shooting, she was saying something completely different. But we needed her to convey a little more information about the creeper and some other things. So I literally rewrote her side of the phone conversation and kind of tailored it around the kids' reactions because that was the only thing that I was sort of anchored to as far as what was uh, visible on film. That's what it likes to call it. It's house of pain. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I don't know if it's a demon or a devil. Or just some hungry thing from some dark place in time. Oh, like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I just know it's not going to stop coming after you or anyone else it wants to. Because we were so squeezed for space in the warehouse where that housed the art department and many of the sets that were built, the shot of Giselle's living room here is actually the cafeteria of the art department, which for one day had to become Giselle's digs. We're beating you? The license plate on its truck. Right, beating you? No, think about it. This is my high school graduation picture, doctored up to look like a record album from the 1930s with Jeepers Creepers on it. Now, that's not Patricia Belcher's hand. She wasn't in Florida at the time we shot this. So uh, we had to just sort of cast a hand model that we hoped matched hers. The reason for that is that we had a lot of weather problems in Florida, and we were often rushing around to sets to get out of the rain, and we had to shoot her living room unexpectedly long before she arrived in Florida to actually shoot her part. Fuck you, lady! Just looking at this diner reminds me of what a spectacular job Stephen Legler did, and Don Fauntleroy, too. I mean, the... The cinematographer and the production designer really need to work arm in arm. These guys just uh, surpassed all my expectations on every scene. Let's talk with the cops and get the hell out of here. Here we are in tonight, which is good news for all cast and crew members of Jeepers Creepers because that means that temperatures are going to drop now. Why it could be is chilly as 70 degrees as we shoot the uh, rest of the shooting schedule in nights. In fact, at 3 a.m., 4 a.m., the temperatures actually got absolutely wonderful where you could walk around and feel cool. We shot two months in Florida. A month and a half of that was nights, which means that when you're shooting nights, your day starts at like 5 in the afternoon and ends when the sun comes up. So you have to adopt a kind of vampire-like existence to make a movie like this, and I keep writing them to happen at night after swearing I will never do that again. I blame part of that on the fact that my projects come so far apart that I've usually forgotten everything I hated about the previous experience and then jump right into a new one and uh, do the same things that I swore I'd never do again. Who were they again? Darla Cleway and Kenny Brian. Found their car all That's John Bashara and Avis Marie Barnes as Troopers Gideon and Weston. And John, we keep emphasizing his head for obvious reasons. You said they still had skin on him and he had a ring on his finger. What are you saying? 
I told you, I, I grabbed one of them like this. I, and it was hard, like petrified wood, like he preserved them or something. He's got them all stitched together like some kind of quilt. I'm just trying to get all the facts And here. I told you the facts. Justin's monologue here was, uh, we had a great time shooting this, actually. He had a few takes where we just really let him go, and he just really ripped into uh, Trooper Gideon here. It turned out to be not emotionally appropriate for the tone of the rest of the scene, but I remember it was really wonderful to watch him go. He's an actor with tremendous depth and range. Stuck up on the walls like some... Psycho version of the Sistine Chapel. The idea of the psycho version of the Sistine Chapel came from Brian Panicus, who suggested that maybe the bodies are hung up on the walls like something like the Sistine Chapel. And when I hear a delicious idea like that, I just jump on it, and very soon it's part of the vernacular of the script. Hey, that's your car out the pumps, isn't it? That's Peggy Sheffield as the waitress, about to take us out to what I thought, when originally writing this story, would be the most chilling scene in the film. I don't know if that's true now or not, but when I was writing it, to me there was nothing scarier than hearing that a bunch of people in a restaurant were looking out the window and watching a strange man sniffing laundry out of your car. He was standing there at your car, sniffing that laundry. The whole thing gave me kind of the willies, and the concept was, could I give the audience the willies at this point by letting them know that this was no ordinary man? If nothing else, he was pretty kinky. Which way he run off, Binky? Still think I bumped my head? Huh? Yeah, time to get to the church, then back here. And this guy is after us! There's that head again. He's after us because he knows what we saw. And another pair of pink underwear. And now he even knows my name! These are the great themes of Jeepers Creepers, I think. Central, this Some is wonderful so local faces here, just hey. wonderful. You interested in a handprint? 037, go ahead, please. I love the fact that we picked the Chevy. It has so many beautiful lines, and in a shot like that, uh, there's just there's no bad angle on this thing. You can dust that, right? Get a this moment always uh, makes me wonder if there's such a thing as too subtle. We put a digital shadow across the sign behind Gina, right there, and a single sound of a wing flap to suggest something flying overhead, and. We had varying degrees of that digital shadow. We had it darker, we had it lighter, and finally we agreed on this one thing. And sound, too. I wanted something very soft, almost suggested. I don't know if I get the point across, though, that, uh, that something flew past that sign as she was staring out. We had debates of how loud the sound should be coming in off that really quiet shot because that is kind of a, a cheap way of getting another jump out of your audience. At the final mix, we had it up so much louder than it is now that it seems tame by comparison. You know, it's funny, as a director, you promise yourself you'll never do cheap shots like that when someone does them to you when you're watching their film. But as soon as you have the opportunity to, it's, it's a different story. You have to be superhuman, otherwise the smell would have killed them. We called this our Sugarland Express shot because we rolled back and forth between these two cars. It was quite an ordeal to do something that I thought was fairly simple, but I thought it was so much better to be able to roll back and forth between them instead of cutting from car to car that I'm, I'm really glad we did it. I think our effort definitely paid off. I'm up to my ass in fire and rescue, but I can tell you right now, no one's going inside this thing for a long, long time. incest camp of the world. Oh, don't be such a snot. Tell me you actually like him. There's a radio sequence coming up as Gina kind of flits through the stations here that was created by a very good actor friend of mine, Tom Tarantini. The amazing thing about it is he not only created the music, but he also performed many of the vocals here. I want to bring him in my anthro class for showing. In sports, the next. This was the first time that Tom actually came to location and stayed the duration of the show. I use Tom as my sounding board for uh, just about everything. He's my bastion of good taste and uh, also it lets me know when something is working and something is not. I think a lot of directors surround themselves with people who just say yes to everything and sometimes we need to hear no and Tom's not afraid to do that. 
So as a result, he is an integral part of what I consider my creative process. Say what? That's the song! The creeper standing up here on the car is, I think, one of the most indelible shots in the film, and it also completely redefines the kind of movie that we're in. Suddenly we know that this is something very supernatural and very powerful. This whole sequence with all this mayhem was enormously difficult to shoot, but incredibly pleasurable to watch when you see all the pieces and stunts and makeup and everything come together. I like the way this little tiny hubcap spins to a stop. I think everything in a film has to have peaks and valleys, the sound, the music, the drama, and this is one of those great things of going from screeching crescendo to dead silence, which is a wonderful valley and a very eerie one. One thing I loved about working with Gina is that she has a wonderful range and you can really ask her for just about anything and she'll give it to you. It has to make sense, it has to be authentic to her perception of the character, but um, I felt that we were both on, on the same page for much of the show and uh, thoroughly enjoyed the experience of kind of exploring and creating Trish with her. There's that head again. Let's start the engine here, you can just barely hear it, and I'm, I'm sorry that people don't realize that the engine is running, even though it's so silent. Here's the creeper in his creeper garb, designed by the wonderful May Villalobos, our costume designer, who did a terrific job aging and styling. We thought that since this is such an ancient creature and that he's probably collected clothes over the years that this might be some sort of a Civil War coat, maybe. Because this scene has the potential of being really gross and shocking, the billboard, it's meant to just take the edge off it a little tiny bit and to remind us that we are watching a campfire story. It can still be scary, it can still be horrifying, but I want us to have fun at the same time. Let's see this. What is he doing? We had a terrible time with this artificial tongue because it kept snapping out and hitting the creeper in the face, which is exactly the opposite of the effect we wanted. They put oil on a tire when they really want it to smoke like that as it spins, and uh, we burned a lot of oil on this film. The next scene is the only real scene that takes us away from the kids in the entire story. And it's really just a device because I need to get away from them for a moment so when I go back to them, they can kind of be past their shock. It also gave me another opportunity to toy again with just how funny the creeper should be. Come on! 
when you're gonna kill us! I mean it! Slow down! Slow down! And here we are at the second act finale, the Cat Lady House, with the wonderful Eileen Brennan. I don't think I've ever had more fun working with anyone, especially someone that I respect so much and have loved for so many years. How far's the next town? You mean the next phone? Because it's pretty goddamn far. You want to wait to find out? I had seen Eileen in a wonderful short called Nunzio's Second Cousin. Eileen just absolutely glowed in this short, and it brought back everything that I had loved about her throughout her entire career. I really started to think of her as the cat lady, not knowing if she would ever do it or not. No, come on, Trish, look at this place. Let's just keep going. I mean it, come on. But you don't want to get help? Help from who? We just use the phone, okay? Yeah, and call who? I don't know. And tell them what? I don't know. No, oh, hey, bum, fuck, police. I'm being chased by a guy who likes to pull tongues out of severed heads with his teeth. Is there a special extension for that? Come on. Christ, you think they're gonna have a phone? I'm guessing no phone and a lot of guns. Who are you? One thing Eileen is is an incredibly intelligent actress. Then I needed someone like her to portray this character without going into cartoon land, and she really did a wonderful job in coloring this woman. Patricia Jenner, this is my brother Derry. What do you want? A telephone? I don't have one. I see we keep driving till we see people. She is. What you need a phone for if I had one? I kept her in shadow for most of the scene. I just felt like this should be a very mysterious moment and that she would be hiding kind of in the dark anyway, trying to figure out what these kids were about. When the finished film was edited, though, and I saw how long I kept her in the dark, I was a little regretful that I didn't uh, put a little more light on her earlier since the lights go out very shortly after she turns them on. People can have... I'll have as many cats as I want to have. You can tell them that for me. Please, someone's been killed. This was an incredibly difficult sequence because we had 30 cats um, on this enclosed porch, and they had been trained to do various things, and the cats... Most of them liked Eileen, however, the one she kept trying to grab, that white one that was always in a bad mood, <laughs> didn't like her at all. And finally, she bonded with this nice little blonde one, but uh, they didn't always jump up on the porch ledge in the same order. So each take, she would pick up a different colored cat, which was uh, quite distressful to my wonderful script supervisor, Patty Fullerton. This happens all the time. Ah! Holy shit. Uh, these cats were trained to climb up on the screen, which was later deleted from the scene. But they were trained by um, rubbing tuna up on the screen. So when you look at all these cats and see them staring up, they're actually staring up, wondering if there's tuna up there for them. Kids got anyone else with you? This actual tree and scarecrow was shot at a completely different location and on the very last day of shooting. That's not my scarecrow. My physical effects guy, Michael Arbogast, asked me um, exactly how big I wanted this scarecrow to explode because the idea is that the creeper moves so fast that she really only blows apart the scarecrow behind him. And uh, we both agreed that this explosion was a little too big for a shotgun blast, but not only did we not have time to redo it, we felt that we should just take some poetic license here and let it go. Mike Arbogast, aside from being eminently qualified 
piqued my curiosity about working with him because when he was a young boy, he spent one summer in Martha's Vineyard with his dad, Roy, who was doing the mechanical shark effects for Jaws. Since Jaws was such a life-altering experience for me at 16, uh, it was really great to have an Arbogast on one of my movies. Again, the wonderful production design of Stephen Legler and uh, Don Fauntleroy lighting work really make this part of the Cat Lady sequence, I think, a, a wonderfully eerie valley again. We've just had our peak, and now here we are with another very creepy valley that's kind of going to build up to another peak. We really wanted Eileen to do this stunt where the creature has her by the neck and walks her across the porch. Mike Arbogast and my stunt coordinator, Jim Churchman, created this device that really allowed Eileen to sit on this little seat and roll across as if she were being held off her feet by the creeper. Ah. Here is our first really good reveal of Jonathan Breck as the creeper. That was a stunt lady being tossed aside like a rag doll. The only time that we stunted Eileen for anything. This starts the second act finale, which is uh, contains some wonderful wire work by uh, Jim Churchman and a uh, series of different stunt actors who played the creeper. But that is Breck himself falling onto the uh, hood. Breck did any stunt that he thought he could do. He really wanted the screen time, and I think it's always great when the actor can do uh, as much of his own work as possible. Just looking at these shots remind me of the incredible contribution that Brian Penicus and Makeup and Monsters made to Jeepers Creepers. What do I do? Hit him. along with Brad Parker, who designed the Creeper. Do it! Stuntman Jim Churchman came to me with this idea that if we put a stuntman on a wire, that he could be hit by a car in a way that we'd never seen before. And the idea, as explained to me, lent itself to allowing a stuntman to really dance back and forth over a car. So I took Jim's idea kind of amplified that, and then he got to do his idea in the next moment here when the creeper gets hit by Trish. What the hell is that thing? People who've seen this film always ask me, why don't these kids just drive away from the creeper? And I always answer them that by this point, they feel that there is no escape. It's not fight or flee, it's fight, and they are really trying to just to pulverize him. That's right, walk that other face right over here. Come on. Come on! The creeper had several different stunt doubles depending on the stunt and both Gina and Justin of course had stunt doubles as well depending on what they had to do. You think he's dead? They never are. That's actually Breck rolling away from us. We did run over a dummy but those shots were so unconvincing that as you can see we only use very quick flashes of them here in what I call the pulverizing or the monster mashing sequence.
writing the script, this moment here was truly, to me, the defining moment in the film because this was the moment when out from his tattered coat unfurls this wing that suggests not only is he um, not human but he may not even be humanoid the creeper is a wonderful physical creation by Brian Penicus except for the wings the wings are digitally rendered by the terrific fellows at E equals MC squared, and we worked very hard on getting the right texture and style and movement to them. My hat's off to Buddy Gein, the wing designer and creator, Scott Ramsey and Bob Morganroth, our digital effects supervisor. I don't know how much further this car's gonna go. Far enough. That's a Brian Penicus wing that gets run over there, and. We all kind of laughed as we ran over this thing. It kind of does a wily e. coyote thing sticking up there in the breeze. And we dissolve to Act Three of Jeepers Creepers. And again, we are taken for a moment away from brother and sister to a new environment. Looks like a safe one. Lots of cops, lots of guns, lots of control. I keep bringing the kids to a place where they think they'll be safe, and then we find out that there is no way to be safe from this thing. This is Tom Tarantini, the actor that I told you about earlier. He's playing a character named Roach. Roach, what are we boosting tonight? Well, why don't you come over here and find out, Big Daddy? We had no end of fun dreaming up his name and his attitude and everything about this character. Dad, stop shouting, please. Mom! I, I understand that, Mother. I'm just trying to tell you where we are. Standing right here. I told you, we're both okay. We asked everyone to send in pictures of people of all ages who we could put up on this wall. B-O-L-O, -O, by the way, is be on the lookout, something I didn't know that often gets put on pictures of missing persons. Let us get home, okay? We don't want to be out here any more than you do. Me too. This is another scene between Trish and Derry that was cut way down. They have another kind of bonding moment and another little word war here that you can just barely hear over Patricia Belcher's entrance as Giselle. Patricia? We did casting searches in both Florida and Los Angeles looking for the right woman for Giselle, and Patricia Belcher came in and just hit the nail on the head. Derry Jenner. Giselle Gay Hartman, how do you do? Jess, come on. That's Brandon Smith playing uh, Sergeant Davis Tubbs, who um, I first worked with on Powder and um, just really wanted to work with him again. He helped us out on a missing persons case. You think I could just talk to these kids by myself? They both come in and they kind of get thrown into the mix and it's to their credit that they give such solid performances. And I'm really happy to have added Patricia and Brandon to what I consider my kind of ensemble. But I've come a very long way to see it. You know... I'm not really sure we should be talking to anybody right now. Let's go. You found all those bodies down in that cellar. I saw them too. I dreamed it. I dream a lot of things. We now get a little information about the creature. We are going to get as much backstory about him as happens in the film here. I was under great pressure to um, provide a complete backstory about the creature and uh, not to leave him so enigmatic and mysterious. Advice from people who make horror films for a living and some quite famous ones. I really went against their advice and the advice of the studios and the advice of my agents and managers and said, no, the creeper should be a silent, enigmatic character that we know very little about. In fact, the less we know about him, the more frightening he'll be. I did bend to pressure for a brief moment and wrote several lines for the creeper, but Francis had the wisdom when he read them to say, take these out. What are these even doing here? And uh, I really regretted at that moment that I hadn't gone with my initial gut instincts. 
I don't like knowing this and not knowing why I do. You said it eats? Only certain things. From certain people. Just get away from her, Derek. It eats lungs so we can breathe. And eyes so we can see. Of course, she knows well and good by this point that that's exactly what the creeper is hungry for. He's hungry for the eyes in dairy. Becomes a part of it. It dresses like a man. But only to hide that it's not. This is a shot that took quite a bit of time to set up. It was accomplished on a Titan crane. This was another point in the script where the studio thought that this entire sequence here should just be removed because it was so comical. But I thought that's what was so great about it, that the creeper has such um, compulsive behavior that nothing can stop him from going after this thing that he wants. And I felt that him stumbling toward the police station with a crushed hand and a crushed foot was... Um, funny in a very dark kind of way. How? Never mind how. How does it find out? We're trying to run people off the road? It needs to scare you. There's something in fear, something it can smell, something that tells it if there's anything inside someone that it might... It's another kind of darkly humorous kind of right. concept in this movie that that's the reason for the creeper's road rage. He's just in a great hurry and needs to really freak people out so that in their fear he can smell them. Christ, Jerry, why are we standing here with her? Hello. We got lights and phones out up here. Somebody talk to me. Oh, it's gone. We ran it over till there was nothing left. What the hell? Have we got emergency lights or what? All right, people, we're going to a lockdown situation. That means everybody sit tight, don't move. Let's it's very difficult to do upright shots like this, which I love, because most of our locations are practical, and the lighting setups have to go above the actors, usually. One thing Don and I were always fighting was how to shoot interesting angles without getting the lights in the shot. In a situation like this cell block, with Tommy there like in the bunk, this entire block of cells was built in the warehouse as a set, so we can control the light so much more and we can actually shoot up or down. And the set's built to conceal lights. That is special. I love you too. Heads up, heads up. Move it down there. Thank you for joining us. Show me some skin, that's it. Hands up, gentlemen. Tell me. I think people see this scene as a really grisly and graphic one, but really the chewing and the swallowing is done from the back of the creature, meaning you see absolutely nothing. It's all done with sound. <laughs> Steve Rollerson here is the guard, and he's gone. This police station was actually an old abandoned grammar school that we went in and sort of renovated and dressed as the Poho County Sheriff's Station. Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those peepers? We heard it in the car hours ago. No! Every time Jeepers Creepers is used in this film, we have to pay for it. And it's interesting. It gets sang, it gets whistled. And all these things are considerations for your budget because music rights can get very expensive. We had plans to use the Sinatra version of Jeepers Creepers and 
the Mills Brothers and many others, but we just found that we really did not have the money to use all these different versions. So we chose one, and we used it to uh, both instances in the film. We got a situation down here, Sarge. It's hit up the rear stairs. You copy? Coming up the rear stairwell. Stay here. Get you out of here. Come on, I said. This is one of my favorite cues of Bennett's in the score, and the only one that I asked him to rewrite when he played the original sketch for me. It didn't have drive and punch. At this point, I wanted the story to really elevate another peak here before we go into this little quiet valley. Somebody down there talked to me. We have one inmate and one officer down. Ramirez, he's hurt bad. The son of a bitch, he tried to take a bite out of him. He what? Oh, 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 oh. This guy is wearing something, Sarge. Because I'm a son of a bitch, but we cannot take him down. What the hell do you mean, wearing something? This is another instance of really playing a scene without seeing it. Here these folks are hearing about this private little war going on down below between the creature and the cell block. The challenge for me was to make something scary without showing it. You are not making one goddamn bit of sense. The concept of this scene is like an old radio show. You only hear voices. You have to kind of put in your own mind what's going on down there. That's probably much more horrible than anything I could have taken the time to shoot. We just lost him on the stairwell. The bald-headed police officer back there is Jonathan Breck, who uh, plays the Creeper. We wanted to find a place for him where he could appear without his Creeper makeup. That's him right there. So he became a cop, um, witnessing his own attack on this officer. <laughs> This effect of the hole in the officer was achieved digitally, once again, by e equals MC squared. The flare coming through the hole, which was my way of doing something really graphic, but without a lot of blood, was wonderfully handled by the digital guys again. That's the creature gulping, actually, that's triggering their gunfire. He's wolfing down that heart or whatever he pulled out of the officer. This hallway of the police station is shot in a completely different school, another abandoned school. The doors that Gina is banging on right there lead to a thrift shop, actually. You didn't know that? I don't dream everything! This isn't everything! This is our way out! It's not like watching a movie, honey. There are parts missing sometimes. We have to get out of here now. There's no other way except the front. Well, the front door is out. Why didn't you dream of something useful? I thought if you knew what I saw, maybe you could change it. Why the hell do you think I'm here? This is the dramatic pinnacle of the movie right here, and it's a tribute to these actors, uh, how they elevated this moment in my script. I could have never dreamed it would be so meaningful. And when you walked in, you know who it wants. You know what it wants. I've dreamed this. You know what's gonna happen. In the original script, the creeper, who was still dressed in all of his rags, came running at Giselle and opened his arms, and the cape kind of opened up and just brushed over her and left her sort of untouched, and suddenly he was gone. But since we had decided that the naked creeper was so cool that we wanted to see it earlier in the film, we were suddenly uh, faced with, okay, what do we do? The creeper is naked in this scene now. I forget whose suggestion it was, 
I think Brian Panicus said, well, maybe he should crawl down the wall. And uh, when a suggestion like that is made, then the stunt people and the physical effects guys, uh, so Mike Arbogast and Jim Churchman and Brian Panicus, they all put their heads together, and they came up with this wonderful wire rig that allowed the creeper to actually climb down the wall. It's not a digital effect. It's not a composite. It's actually done live with a stunt actor on a wire. And we can wonderfully tie in Patricia with the actual creeper who crawls right over her head so that we can tilt up like this and see that he's gone. This was her first day of shooting, poor lady. She got down on her knees, the creature came up behind her. Breck is completely blind with these contact lenses on, so the creeper really can't see where he's grabbing or what he's doing. And uh, Patricia really went right into the frying pan on the first day of shooting, and I felt sorry for her because it was a tumultuous way to start off her shooting schedule. This is our interrogation room set, built in the same warehouse, about 50 feet away from the Cavern of the Dead set. Donnie said that I had to cut away from this window very quickly because, number one, there's no glass, and number two, it's completely black out there past the hanging moss, and it really shouldn't be. This two-way mirror sequence is, I think, a nod to one of my favorite moments in The Creature from the Black Lagoon, where Julia Adams goes swimming in the lagoon and the creature kind of mirrors her without her knowing it. After seeing the dailies for this, I just thought it was so strange and kind of weird in a sense it reminded me of something and then I totally flashed on the fact that this is kind of what the creature does with Julia Adams in a way. I think moments in movies like that are so indelible that they come out kind of naturally and you don't know where they've come from but you can see what their origins are. <laughs> The Creeper's doing the sniff test now. Once again, this is a much smaller finale than we had planned. On some level, though, it did force us to create an emotional finale as opposed to a pyrotechnic finale. Here comes some great makeup work from Makeup and Monsters. Both Brad Parker and Brian Panic has created this wonderful open-faced creature. It's quite an elegant and wonderfully ornate sort of creation. There's something crustaceous about the parts of the face that now are revealed. I can't, I can't. Take me. Gina Phillips did such an amazing job that um, at one point we toyed with the idea of the creature really responding to her. You can take it from me. <laughs> you don't want dairy. No, you don't. Both the kids were so incredible in this. It just, uh, it kind of raised my little monster movie into a kind of operatic tragedy, which I absolutely love. <laughs> I won't bite you. You can take In many people's me. minds, I'm sure that they would have liked to have seen that creeper drop dairy and these guys all blast the creeper with their guns. But 
I couldn't give this story a happy ending. I didn't think that it would be fair to the audience to really have an ending where the creature dies and that these kids outwit this incredible beast. You go! I like the operatic tragedy of this, and Bennett's music supports it, and the wonderful visuals support it, and yes, it's shocking and sad, but I make all my films as popular entertainment, but I don't think popular entertainment precludes the idea of doing tragedies, which are extremely powerful and always have been. The kind of denouement here between Trish and Giselle was shot in one wide shot and in silhouette only because we had completely run out of time. So we took a risk and we decided we would do the whole thing in a long shot. And whether that was the right decision or not, it was the only decision at the time. Your folks just pulled up outside. Never answered him. Are your dreams ever wrong? Dare he screaming in the dark while that song is playing? What did that mean? What did you really say? I'm just a crazy old woman. You ask anyone around here, they'll tell you. That's all I am, just a crazy old woman. Bennett is reprising his brother-sister theme here, and as Trish steps out of the station and looks up and sees the crow, I really like that Bennett found a way to open that theme up and create really a moment of musical beauty in the film. The first time I heard it, I, uh, I thought it was wonderful, and I thought, in his own way, Bennett was sort of elevating the picture again beyond my expectations. I don't feel like I've rewritten the face of horror cinema. I just am very proud of Jeepers Creepers and all the people that contributed to it. The interesting thing about this is the screams there of Derry in the distance are done by Tom Tarantini. Justin was unavailable, and Tom, he really nailed Justin's scream so well that when people hear them, they're always shocked to find that that's not Justin wailing in the distance. We, of course, were under pressure after preview audiences did not like the ending of Jeepers Creepers. There were even plans, and I'd even written a different ending, and uh, not one that really compromised the tone of the film, but one that was a little less shocking than seeing Derry with his eyes removed. But that really is the final card played, that the Jeepers Creepers song is much darker and ironic than we might have ever thought. That is Justin as the creeper looking out at us through Justin as Derry. 
one of the great finds of Jeepers Creepers for me is when I found this song, Hush, Hush, Here Comes the Boogeyman. It's a British song performed by Henry Hall and the BBC Dance Orchestra. And uh, I found it completely by accident. I believe I found it online. And when I heard the words and the sound, I felt that in a way it summed up the film even better than the song Jeepers Creepers because it's sweet, creepy, twisted, innocent. It's kind of all the places that we've been to in the movie and uh, summed up with sort of a very strange and kind of morbid twist. I do like the fact that it sort of lightens again the um, deepest and darkest moment of the film. As the end credits roll, I would just like to thank a whole bunch of people, some of whose names you'll see up here, some you won't. Bobby Driscoll, who is my DP, Don Fauntleroy's chief lighting technician, all the terrific work that he did with Donnie on the film. Uh, my sound mixer, Joe Foglia, and his incredible team. Our still photographer, Gene Page, who got some amazing shots. The costumers, Victor Valentine and Barnaby Smith. From Makeup and Monsters, the entire team there, including Elvis Jones, who was the animatronic designer and sculptor. Barry Opper, who was Jeeper's first champion, really helped create the film and create the environment for which uh, the movie could be made. And uh, it's very strange to maybe think about this, but even a film as grim and dark as Jeepers Creepers, we had an enormously good time on. We very carefully, on my films, select people for not just their talent, but also their personality, because uh, you really do become a family, and uh, a family of 150 dysfunctional people coming together to, uh, with a common purpose to create this story. and. Uh, the Jeepers family was really wonderful. I can't think of when I've had a better time and laughed harder all the while killing and eating people and doing everything <laughs> grisly that happens within the context of the film. Um, in the Bennett Salve music camp, uh, Greg Townley and Chad DeSensei. Out in Florida, um, Jude Hagen, our location manager, Sue Gummerson, and all the little Gummersons. Some of the folks at E equals MC squared that I didn't mention, um, Lucas Feld, who was an animator for The Wings, and Queen Goddess of Wire Removal, Noli, in the art department, once again, Kevin Eglund, Scott B. Valdez, in the effects department, Mike Arbogast, as I said, and his crew, Tom Kittle, my wonderful assistants, Jared Rivett and Brian Hirschberger. Um, at Craft Service, Drew. Thanks for all those Salva specials right around 3 a.m., Drew. Gloria Winship and Shane Ayan of Animal Actors Sweet Sunshine. And all the really wonderful people in Central Florida who allowed us to make Florida our home for the brief time that we were there shooting our picture. You've probably heard this ad nauseum, but uh, film is a collaborative art form, I am pleased and proud to have so many gifted and talented collaborators that contributed to Jeepers Creepers. It wouldn't be the picture it is without them. So a final thanks to the entire Jeepers family, and uh, I'll see you at the movies. <laughs>